What Drives You is brought to you by Ziggler, your premier source for equipping life and leadership coaches. Visit Ziggler.com and let them inspire your true coaching performance. Yeah. We're on a journey together to unearth what really drives you, what matters most, so you can drive further, faster, and enjoy the ride. This is What Drives You, and I'm your host, Kevin Miller. Welcome to What Drives You. I am your host, Kevin Miller, and thanks again for joining me as I talk with today's most influential change makers to uncover what truly drives them and extract the big takeaways from their insights so you can integrate that wisdom and leverage the power of your unique inner drive and wake up every day to your authentic, driven, and inspired life. In this episode, I am back with Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Charles Duhigg, author of the landmark bestseller. I'm holding it up for the video. My favorite resource on habits, The Power of Habit. And it's led by Charles and the message in his new book, Super Communicators, How to Unlock the Secret Language of Connection. Here, as always, we go behind the scenes with my What Drives You episode to find out what drives Charles in these key areas of life and to hear what he values and how he strives to walk these out in his daily habits. And as the guy who wrote The Power of Habit, I expect to learn a few <laughs> things or at least learn about uh, Charles and also to find more about how to become a super communicator and how that's influenced his own life. Uh, you can find, again, the book Super Communicators anywhere and connect with Charles for all that he's doing and to literally ask him questions. You can go to Charles Duhig. Dot com. That's D-U-H-I-G-G.com. All right. Well, let's talk about what drives Charles, what those values are, what the power of those habits are doing for Absolutely. you. Absolutely. And thank you for having me on. I'm really excited to, to talk about it. And I might ask questions back if that's okay. You but. can ask your, your <laughs> show. You can interview me if you want, Charles. Uh, it's fair enough. It's so funny because now that with the book and everything, me being on the other side, sometimes I kind of like forget. You know, and I'll start asking questions. Wait, wait, not my show. Uh, but no, you you go. All right. Wait, well, hey, the first one here then is spiritual, spirituality. Tell yeah. me what's driving you in that area of your life today. So it, that's a great question. And and I'm gonna ask you this back. So I, I grew up um I grew up attending church, Catholic church, and sometimes going to synagogue. My mom was Jewish, my dad was Catholic, um, which worked out pretty well, actually. It was like a nice combination. And and since then, I've kind of followed. My wife is a scientist; she's a geneticist, and is and and she grew up Episcopalian, but like sort of is adamantly um, agnostic. And and I think that what we've found is that as we've had kids, we've found this really important spiritual aspect of our life around. I'm going to call it justice. That like I am so inspired by the the example of people who live for service for others, hmm. right? There's just something, I mean, I, I hate to use this word godly, but there's something godly about people who genuinely try to help others for self-disinterested reasons. And, and, and as I see this more and more, I realize this is actually a complicated spirituality, right? Deciding what is just and what is not does not mean that you get to just sort of rely on some easy some easy answer like like it's oftentimes hard to figure out what's the right thing to do in this situation and yet i do think that when we think about that and when we answer that question we become something bigger than just ourselves and i found real meaning in that now let me ask you like tell me tell me about your spiritual life that's a long question. I, 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 I'll start with saying, I mean, just what you said. I mean, I have a lot of people on the show. I ask this question. We got people from all walks of lives, all, all walks of spirituality. And it does come down to, I, I, it's gotten me to now defining spirituality at the base level as devotion to something greater than self. Yeah. Um, which is generally going to be really good. Go ahead. Uh, I, I, that's a really good definition. Well, I, I, I've, I've had people, you know, here, Harvard professors and, and whatnot, and I've got one in mind that I won't name. Well, I guess it was recorded, but anyways, uh, you know, who was like, I don't really know. It, it's just, I don't really have a file for that. I said, well, you're sitting here with a book that you felt compelled to write and offer this years of research and offer yourself to people. That's a greater purpose. To me, that's the core. She's like, that makes sense. And so yeah. it really has to me, um, 
You know, it's interesting. I I grew up in a very in the Bible Belt in the South, and you know, a very I, I don't want to call it strict, but it was you know highly religious Christianity. And today, I my answer is I rec- I personally have faith in a in a deity in a God, uh, and and really even in the aspect of of Jesus Christ. And so people say, oh, so you're a Christian? I don't really accept that anymore because that's a construct that has been, you know, created and there's some things in there I don't align with. And I don't, I think you have a hard time making a case out of the Bible, but you know, man has translated in many different ways and I don't align with that, but I do, I look around and gosh, I live out here in the mountains of Colorado and I just can't get myself to not uh, believe in some kind of intelligent design. Yeah. And um, now I, I, so I live in Santa Cruz. You mentioned, um, that you surf sometimes. So one of the reasons that we live in Santa Cruz is because my wife and I like to surf oh, and I'm not, a, I'm not a good surfer at all. I ride a long board. I actually ride an 11 foot long board. Like I'm a terrible surfer, but when I'm out on the waves and, and this reminds me of what you just said, yeah. talking about being in, in Colorado, the only way that you can surf is by really getting in touch with the ocean, right? Like you're paying attention to how the waves are coming in, how the wave is moving, when you could catch it. You really have to feel kind of this huge natural thing around you in order to do the, do the sport. And, and for me, that is actually a very spiritual experience. Yeah. Like, and you're, and there's pelicans flying by and otters and, you know, it's just, it's kind of magical, but it's part of this. It's part of this world that is bigger than ourselves. And, and I don't, I don't, I don't pretend to know, like, I don't assign like the deity status to the ocean. I don't, I don't think there's some Gaia mother. Like, like, I don't, I don't need that to have that spiritual experience because I just feel plugged in to something that is some sort of, sort of timeless. And that feels good. Feels great. I I'm with you. The mountains are vitamins for my soul though I'll I'll to to relate Charles now I feel now I feel conscious <laughs> of coming back okay <laughs> Kevin's using the stuff he learned from me on me um but I I relate to the ocean my my wife loves the water and have my I've gotten I'd say my second love in this scenario is the ocean itself yeah uh, and on the surfing this year was my first so oh really uh, February, maybe I went with, uh, I mentioned them in the first, uh, first series uh, episode group of guys, kind of my adventure group. I think 12 of us went to Sayulita, uh, Sayulita. Oh yeah. I've served Sayulita. It's amazing. Okay. Well, they went there for sure. I've always been on the other side, the, uh, Caribbean side where there's not yeah. many waves. So we went there for surfing and, uh, did it. And the first day I can't remember feeling as incompetent as I did I <laughs> got beat to death, uh, by the waves. It was, it was still, you know, awesome as far as awe inspiring, but I just got beat to death. But the second day we went to a different, we went down the road to some other place and it was so much easier. And, you know, I vaguely got up a little bit, but, um, I'm, I'm ready to try it again. I, I, but I appreciate that the reading of it, like you talked about. Yeah, no, it's, it's really, and there's like, I, yeah, I mean, I think anyone who, and I imagine you get this from bike, from biking too, right. That like, there's just something about being so in touch with the physical world Yeah, that, that just feels really rejuvenating. It, it is. It makes, uh, makes me feel small in a good way. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really nice way of putting it. Hmm. Okay, well, we're, I'll, I need to come out there. Do you know? Do you know Guy Kawasaki? Yeah, yeah, Guy lives out here. I was gonna say, I think he lives out there. And last time I had him on, that's all he could talk about was sir. He loves. Oh, really? Oh, I yeah. see him sometimes on the morning break. Oh, I'll, I'll go so out sweet. for like Dawn Patrol, and he'll be out there. I, I heard recently from uh, one of the publishers or agencies. He's got a new book out, and what I have him on the show. Are you kidding oh. me? I love him. It's it's been a couple of years, but yeah, uh, that's awesome. That's what I thought about with surfing. I love his love, <laughs> and uh, appreciate yeah. what you do. Um, next one is okay. relationships, you know, yeah. what drives you there? And man, I got to call out to your book. I mean, at the core of it, uh, your book, super communicators is uh, you know, the greatest value that I see in it, that I'm feeling that I'm excited about why we're doing the series is on how I can, as we talked about better connect with people. So I imagine, so I'm going to ask you what drives you with, with the relationships. I imagine there's a story of, as you went through this research and wrote the book that it, altered for the good your habits around relationships. Yeah. And and I will actually say, I think relationships are the most important driver for me. Like I just, if I, if when I die, people say like, 
I really, he was important to me and I felt like we had important, meaningful times together. That's really all that I want out of life. And investing in relationships is incredibly important to me. But what's interesting is that that was kind of a learned capacity. So when I was in high school, I grew up in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And in high school, I was really into debate. Mm -hmm. And and so basically I would wake, I mean, my whole life was about debate. I would just like, that's all I wanted to do. And I had some friends through debate, but like, I never, I wasn't, debate is a very solo activity. It's very much about combat. I was going to say, right? it's not connection. Uh, no, it's not connection. It's about winning. It's about beating the other person. And so when I went to college, I remember this very distinctly my freshman year, I just wasn't good at being a friend. Like I liked friends and I liked having friends, but I had never, it had never occurred to me that this is a skill you have to practice. Like this is something you really have to invest in. And there were a couple of people at college freshman year who did do that. Like there, one of my roommates was this guy named Adir. He would drive me crazy and he's now one of my best friends, but Adir Adir invested in friendship. Adir would like spend the awkward time and the hard time to get to know someone. He would like show up when like you didn't, when he didn't have to show up, but it was, you appreciated having him there. And that model of watching people who were good at being friends made me realize like, this is something I really have to take seriously and something I have to work at. And, and relationships are the most important. You mentioned that you had Robert Waldinger on, who now oversees the, the Harvard um, adult, uh, study of adult behavior and happiness. And of course, this lines up with what, what he has found and, and what I mentioned in Super Communicators. Like, relationships are everything. And I find so much meaning and reward in my life from my relationships, my relationships with my wife, with my kids. Yeah. My relationships with friends. We do this thing called drinks with journalists in New York and now in California, where we just basically send out an email to all the journalists in the city saying, like, come have a drink. And it's wonderful. It's the, right? ink, it's, it's the inklings. Exactly. Exactly. And it's fantastic. And like, you just hang out with some people you haven't seen in a while and everyone loves coming to this thing. And I am shocked that more people don't do it themselves, but, but making those connections and investing in those connections that is, those relationships are the most important thing in my life. And the thing I enjoy the most. How, uh, how t tangibly, tactfully, I mean, how has this book, your research and writing that, how, how did it, talking about habits, it's got to have affected how you yeah. enter into those conversations. So now when you go to talk to your wife or you realize, oh, she's coming to me with something or you know, somebody else, especially the important ones in your life, like you talked about with work when it's a, a, a weighty conversation. I think it's given me a lot more permission to listen more closely hmm. and to be vulnerable myself. Like, I think that like, and I'd be curious if this was your experience too, that particularly with, with kids, I think that for a long time, I thought that my job in many conversations was to get us to like a resolution or to shape the conversation or, or get to this place that I thought was important to get to. Like with my kids, it's like, I want you to learn a lesson, yeah. but if I tell you the lesson right away, you're not going to listen. So like, I need to like while my way to the lesson. And the thing that like super communicators has taught me is number one, speaking the same language as the other person being at the level they are at literally being on their wavelength is how you connect. And so it's not about, shaping things. It's not about like trying to control things. It's about letting go of control and saying like, I'm going to invite you to follow me and I'm going to follow you and we'll see where this goes together. But then also just the power of vulnerability that I feel like, and I think that part of this is being a Gen X male and, ha and being a father that like, I felt like, I felt like vulnerability was weakness, not, not all the time, but sometimes. And the thing that the research has really shown me is the more vulnerable you are with other people, the more they admire and respect you and the more you can connect with them. Yeah. And so giving into that vulnerability, letting myself be vulnerable, that's been transformative and that's a habit, right? That's just something that like you become habituated to and it happens more, more automatically. It's so interesting to me that you said, and I quote permission to listen. Those don't usually go together. Permission, <laughs> it usually feels like a requirement. I got to, you know, I know I'm supposed to listen, but permission 
to listen. And it's interesting too, as you went on talking there, Charles, that you talked about your kids. That's been such a big transition for me. I hadn't thought about it that way. Uh, that I felt this when they're talking about something, I felt this responsibility to, yeah. I don't know if it's the control, but to, you know, get some meaning, like, like you said, a, a learning totally. lesson or something out of that. And now I'm going to have, the, you, again, that's why you're here. It helped conceptualize these things I've been playing with to permission to listen that I can just listen. And that's the value. That's the value. That's the value to like, yeah. if they, if you want to talk about like something super deep and they want to talk about Fortnite, it's okay to give yourself permission to just talk about Fortnite. Like that for them is a super meaningful conversation. Now, now let me ask you something. Cause how many kids do you have? Nine. Nine. Okay. So I imagine that how you communicate with them and listen, and I have nine siblings. So, so I, wow. so big families, I, I know big families. Okay. Um, do you feel like how you communicate and listen as a dad has changed over the course of those nine kids? Yes. I mean, uh, conscientiously. Yeah. Yeah. How so? Like, well, like, um, gosh, I mean, I, I've told this story. My wife read this, she was reading about attachment and, and the idea of, you know, the kid runs in crying with a bloody knee and, you know, man, I care about them. It's my kid. And I just, oh my gosh, okay, let's get it cleaned up and get a Band-Aid on it and, and, and fix it, right? And, and she said, actually, she's just reading. Actually, it shows that oh, attachment is greater if you would just give them a hug and say, I'm so sorry. That was just a bold change. I was like, okay, next time kid comes in, I just, it's bleeding all over the floor and down their leg, whatever. Okay, I'll give them a hug. I give them a hug. I'm, yeah. like, gosh, I'm so sorry, that must hurt. And they just take off. No Band-Aid, no cleaning up. <laughs> like, holy crap. So take that into talking that so often now, you know, I've got teens and older kids and they'll share something. And me, back to what you said, you know, not feeling so responsible for one that it's, I'm not God. Um, I'm not yeah. I'm here if they need help. Half the time they don't ask. I just, you know, try to help and they're not even asking. And just to listen, and permission to listen. That's a, dude, that's a book title right there. Permission it's that's, but, and it's no. it, and there's all kinds of things that we have to give ourselves permission for, right? Like, because no. the truth of the matter is that, like, when you are trying to teach your kids a lesson, it's not because you're a jerk; it's because right. you're a good dad. Like, you want to do the right thing as a dad, and sometimes it's okay to give ourselves permission to like not be the dad, or to be the dad that just like talks about Fortnite. I I think about this all the time with one of my kids, like. Like we drive in the car. He loves basketball. I'm always trying to like make some bigger, teach him some bigger lesson. Of course. And he just wants to talk about basketball. Yeah. Like, and he doesn't want to talk about like the warriors and like what they teach us about teamwork. He literally just wants to talk about the warriors <laughs> right. and it not be this big deal. And like, I sort of have given myself permission to like have these silly conversations with him because that's what he wants and he needs. It's interesting. You got me thinking about it, Charles, that yeah, having the permission to listen and not try to impart all the time. Mm -hmm. I don't know for sure. I want to say um, that it may have given me more opportunity to authentically impart by their request. Yes. I'm trying to think with the older ones. I mean, because I've had it, ha it happens now with the older ones, especially. You know, the teens are teens. They're, they're different breeds yeah. uh, for the most part. That's an interesting permission to how, listen. How old is your oldest? Your oldest 28. kid? 28. 28. Okay. And he or she? Uh, well, I have two. One's adopted. So I actually have okay. two that are. Okay. So 28, they're like an Boy, adult. Girl. Yeah. And I imagine that, like, Relating to your kids as adults, as opposed to relating to them as kids, that, that must be a shift too, right? Like, like a different kind of relationship, a different kind of communication. It's all, I mean, it's, it's awesome. Uh, I mean, again, I, I say that and some people, not everybody has a you know great relationship for whatever reason. So compassion there. But for me, it feels, all, uh, it's, it's not fair to say the most profound, but it feels dramatically profound to now be able to talk to them at an adult level. Yeah. And to share, gosh, you talked about that in the first show, to share in humility and, and to, to be honest with stuff, it's, I think speaks to them more than me trying to impart that that yeah. is. And it feels like, it feels, uh, the, the word I use, it feels like a saving grace. 
for the things that totally. I can't fix in the past. But that's a really nice way of putting it that like we get to, I, I, every year my kids get, my oldest is 15. Mm-hmm. Every year they get older. I mean, I miss them being cute and small, but every year they get older is better. It's just a wonderful, but man, again, this is your show. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> I have, I have now, cause I've got kids, you know, who've gone through that and I've realized the opportunity later on when they get out of the house, you know, the responsibility level changes, they're in a new frame of mind and what I am able to, if you're going to look at that, the, the opportunity to impart in their early twenties is I, I, I adore it. Yeah. Being friends and having respect. I mean, it, it takes effort. I would look at it. I saw some of this, I mean, back to your book, super communicators, you know, to think, um, I, I would have to think if I can humbly say, I must've done some of it. Okay. To connect with my kids. Cause we're so well yeah. connected today. Uh, I could probably do better with my teens right now. I'm sure they feel listened to and probably even the teens feel listened to. That's just when you're a teenager, you you can't show that you actually like your parents, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sometimes. Hey, I do want to say to pull out one of the things you said about you leaving high school, going to college, and realizing yeah. you didn't know how to be a friend. That came. That has come up multiple times. That we oh. are not taught how to be friends, and and we get this false sense of it because of community. You go to school. So you're just sitting next to some kid and you, you know, eat lunch and play at recess. And so you're, you know, quote friends, you didn't learn. It just happened. And that happens through school and generally, yeah, college or afterwards, then you kind of get out of that forced group and realize you never did learn how to be friends. So I, I'm seeing that as a common thread with people. Yeah. And it's interesting you mentioned that because, um, you know, in, in power of habit, there's a chapter on the, on the, uh, the marshmallow experiment, the, when they put these marshmallows. Oh, I've basically, I I've, you, you gave that to me, man. I've used, oh, really? I, I watched, oh, I love even, that. even some of my adopted who came from different, you know, hard backgrounds and to see yeah. they didn't have that and to see it, me hoping they'll grow into it, which they have, which they have they, totally. Yeah. Yeah. So, and the, one of the interesting findings that, that's not talked about quite as much is that kids who are good at delayed gratification who are good at resisting the marshmallow, they tend to be more popular in high school. And there's this question why, because like you would think it's because they're like prettier or better at sports. It's actually not that they're better at being friends. And there's, and if you think about like what being a friend is, oftentimes it is delayed gratification, right? Like, like my friend, like I'm going to go sit in a room or I'm going to go introduce myself to someone. It's going to be awkward. It's going to be hard. It, that conversation's not going to be great at first, but I'm, I'm willing to go through that delayed gratification to actually establish a little bit of relationship and then become a friend or you have a problem and I'm going to listen to you talk about your problem and you're so caught up in your problem. You're not going to ask me about myself. But I can do the delayed gratification to be – there's a lot about willpower and delayed gratification that informs how we become friends. But you're exactly right. We have to learn how to do it. And sometimes sometimes we're in environments that don't teach it to us. I, we can keep going down that. It's so powerful because you've got me thinking about it in, re, in regards to your book, Super Communicators, because with the marshmallow – Wait, okay, you got to tell people what they did if they haven't heard it. Just oh, okay, so yeah, so any so in the in the late 1960s there was this researcher named Walter Michelle. He had a 4-year-old daughter. He was a teacher at Stanford, a professor. And he brought his daughter and a bunch of her classmates into a room one by one, and he would put a marshmallow in front of them and say, "Okay, I'm going to leave the room. If you want, you can eat that marshmallow, but if you don't, if when I come back the marshmallow is still there, then I will give you a second marshmallow." And he found about 40% of the kids could resist the marshmallow. And there's like footage of this. It's adorable. Just Google it on YouTube sometime, the marshmallow experiment. It's so cute. So what's really interesting is then, then because it's his daughter and his daughter's friends, this guy, Walter Michelle, he ends up following these, these kids into middle school and into high school and into college and after they graduate from college. And he finds two things. Number one, the kids who could resist the marshmallow they do better than their peers on almost every measure. They get better grades. They get do their homework on time. They're, they're more popular in high school, as I mentioned. They get into better colleges. They get higher paying jobs. They get married earlier and stay married longer. Number two, what he finds out is that you can teach people, teach these kids to resist the marshmallow. And the way that you do it is you essentially kind of make it into a habit. You teach them that, for instance, when the marshmallow is on, on the table in front of you, just take a piece of paper and put the piece of paper on top of it to distract yourself. Mm. Or if there's no paper around and they actually did this, 
think of a frame around the marshmallow. So it seems like a painting of a marshmallow instead of an actual marshmallow. And what they found is that kids got into this habit of finding ways to distract themselves from the temptation. And that once they had that habit, they they could resist the marshmallow again and again and again and get all the secondary benefits. <laughs> so I'm laughing. Hold on. Hold on. All right, I'm going to put this really good tequila in a frame. <laughs> That's so, it's so funny. Hey, man, again, it was so powerful to, to us as parents. So your book that brought that, I know it wasn't your study, but you brought it to us because our, our last kid is adopted. And as I talked about, out of a, a, a Native American reservation. And so she came to us when she was for uh, significant malnourishment. Yeah. Um, just neglect and really bad and food addiction. Um, because she oh, was always afraid that she would not have enough. And so working through that and it was over and over and over, um, you know, honey, you can have, you know, whatever the food was, you can, you can have that, right. have that now, or if you want to save it for tonight, you can have two, you know, we would just do it to train it in there. And did it work over time? Yeah, totally. Totally. That's amazing. But at first it was no way, boom, you know, right. eat, eaten and, or maybe even hoarded or, or something like that. And then to see over time when she gained trust that she really will get, you know, you can get more and to see that play out because to me, it was just, and as you talk about it, it's the, well, okay, go, let's go back to your book, super communicators that I'm in the social group and people are talking and I've got a story and it may be a good one, you know, and I want, oh, I want the dopamine hit. And if yeah. I'll, if I'll just delay it, if I just delay it and ask some questions and dig in and connect with people, I'll get quadruple dopamine hit later. Absolutely. Uh, it's a great analogy for your book. It's marshmallow. It's the conversation marshmallow. Definitely. Yeah, that's exactly right. And and a lot of conversations are like the marshmallow experiment, right? Like, yeah. like I got something to say, but if, if I just listen to you, then I understand like how to say my piece in a way that you'll actually hear it yeah. as opposed to just waiting for you to stop talking so that I, I can start talking. Yeah. Man, this is like, you know, I mean, you could take it a hundred ways, get in the second, you want the second date? And once right. you listen, <laughs> permission to listen and connect and not just try to get a smooch or whatever, you know, whatever you're going for, man, that is, we could stay, we could stay there, but I'm, I'm curious. I want to know more about you. So, uh, health and wellness is the next one. So tell me, I know you surf, so you got some activity there, but tell me what's yeah. dry today. What's driving? How old are you, Charles? I'm 48, 48. Tell I'm me what's turn 49. Okay. So, yeah. So I'm definitely, um, and I will say I, unlike you, I've never been like a natural athlete. Like I'm not someone who like is good at athletics or, or easy at it. I've always been like kind of physically awkward. So the thing that I do is, and my wife, my wife it runs ultra marathons. She runs marathons. She wow. like, she is intense. I am not, I cannot keep up with her like in the slightest. And so what I do is I sign up for half marathons because I want to force myself to train. And in fact, I just signed up for one. I started the training schedule this morning. Hmm. Like the thing is that like, if I can not avoid exercise, I will avoid exercise. So what I use is I use these commitment devices where I sign up for a half marathon because I know it's going to be so God awful painful to do a half marathon. If I'm not in shape that like, it scares me Fair. into running every morning. Fair. And I will tell you, so we just ran a race on Sunday in Monterey, California, I did, I would, I did I, a bunch of stuff came up. I was not able to do my training. So I only ran six miles of the 13 point, whatever of the race and just peeled off. And like, I think a lot of people feel really bad about that. I'm totally okay with it. Cause like I ran those six miles and I was like, you know what? I can absolutely start training for the half now. Like I like, like this was way easier than I thought it was going to be. And I think part of, part of it for me when it comes to health and wellness is about being okay with yourself, like, like being a little forgiving of yourself for our weaknesses, mm. because it's so easy to get in that mindset where like you run three miles and you're like, I should have ran four or you run five and yeah. you're like, I should have run six or you run the six, but you're like, I should have, should have done it at a 30 second per mile faster pace. And like, you can get really down on yourself, but the truth of the matter is you just ran six miles. Like the writing is six miles is not a, is not a small thing. Yeah. And what we know about habits, as you know, is that you need those rewards, right? It's cue yeah. routine reward. And if you're punishing yourself for going and exercising rather than rewarding yourself for exercising, it's going to be harder to exercise next time. 
So, so I try and reward myself, even if it's not living up to the, to the, to the heights that I had hoped for myself, like running a full half marathon. I, I ran a half of a half marathon. Half, I, like the, <laughs> I, no, I, I so like it, Charles, because yeah, coming from my athletic background, you get a lot of the, you know, never quit. You don't quit kind of stuff. Right. And one of my buddies who's, yeah, he's not, he's not led an athletic life at all, but he's, you know, he's our age and trying to be well. And he said, uh, it was so interesting to me. He said it helped him so much when he gave himself permission to quit. Yeah. I, I had never thought about that. And, and not, and not, and not, that doesn't mean that you're a quitter, right? right? Like the next morning you might wake up and like, but like, if you're not giving yourself permission to quit, then you're waking up the next day and you're like, I'm a failure. Yeah. yeah. Whereas like, I just had a bad day. Yeah. Uh, I, I did. Well, so there's a reason though, why you're going. So it's not something you'd tell, you know, we wouldn't choose to go out and run. So what's at the core of it? Health. Okay. Like honestly, like, and, and just like just having a healthier body. I also do some weight training and a lot of like mobility training. Okay. Um, and I just find that like, I sleep better. I feel better. Like my mood is more stable when I, when I'm exercising regularly. Um, I, I mean, I, you know, so, so in the power of habit, we talk about this idea of keystone habits. Yeah. That some habits matter more than others because they set off a chain reaction in people's lives. Yeah. For a lot of people, exercise is a keystone habit. What's interesting is that, for for people who have always been athletes, it tends to be less of a keystone habit. For people like me who weren't athletes in high school and they come to exercise later in life, it's an even more powerful keystone habit because it tends to change how we see ourselves. Hmm. Like it, it, I prove to myself that I'm the kind of person who can run regularly by waking up and running regularly, and I don't assume that's true. Like, like I. I have no evidence from my childhood that that's easy for me. So when I get up and I run and I run a half marathon or I run a marathon, like I'm super impressed with myself Yeah, and it changes how I think about myself. And that's powerful. That's, that is excellent. It's uh, I also just appreciate you as a writer specifically uh, and as a career writer and, and, and an Ivy league guy, cause that's always been, so I, <laughs> I have, I have, uh, I was not an academic at all. And have this picture. It's, it's maybe it's old school now, but it's that that was part of the Ivy League. You know, you go there and you do your studies, and you go out and you run, or you play soccer, or you do whatever. It was part of that because the health and wellness is what helps your brain work. And I, I always love that perspective that I had of that. I think that's really right, and I think that's really right. And I do think that people like you who have been athletes, like I, I am jealous of that because I feel like. I feel like if you make athletics part of your life, by the time you're an adult, it's so easy. Like you were talking about the fact that you, you ride mountain bikes a lot and you don't use an e-bike. And I imagine part of that is because you're a purist and like, but, but a, a non-electric bike is harder on a mountain trail, right? Like you're, you're in it more. And that probably feels very natural and good to you because you've spent a lifetime building up these habits around discipline and exercise and exerting yourself and proving to yourself that you can do things. Mm. And that's so powerful. That is the marshmallow experiment. Yeah. Well, yeah, absolutely. I thank you. I'll accept that. And I also <laughs> revere you after just having written my first book, I got very well schooled that even though I had written a lot, I wasn't a writer. Uh, it's rough. It's hard. It's hard for all of us. How long did it take you to write the book? Uh, two and a half years. It was supposed yeah. to be a year, two and a half years. And my first delivered manuscript to my publisher, uh, I don't want to over exaggerate it, but it was no good. They said, got yep. concepts there, but this ain't, this isn't working. And dude, so, every time, so I've, I've written three books now, every single time I write a book, the first chapter I write, I send it to my editor, we work through it. And then he's like, this is really not good enough to put in the book. Like, let's just throw it away. And we've done that every single time we throw away the entire chapter. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to start over. Writing's hard. Okay, well, like, you've just, done well enough now. You need to keep those and you get like auction. It off. <laughs> the first try, first chapter of the power of habit. They got trashed. So I'd be curious. I, I had to be curious about that. One. I would like to, I don't, I, I, I think it'd be too embarrassing. Uh, fair enough. All right, how about, how about on the uh, nutritional side? What's, what's happening on the nutritional side? I try it. I mean, for my particular body type, I try and avoid carbs, um, and, and eat as many vegetables as I can. I, I actually, so, and this is kind of an interesting thing. 
I use Victoza, which is one of the um, like it's like Ozempec and and Wigovi, those um, those drugs, the the weight loss drugs that are really diabetic drugs. Okay. And the reason why I use it is a doctor actually recommended it to me. He was like, you should try this. Until I had used that, and it basically affects like your blood sugar and sort of how until I had used that, I had never actually not felt hungry. Like I thought that I knew what it was not to be hungry, Mm -hmm. but if I was at a table and there was some food in front of me, I would just thoughtlessly pick it up and eat it. Like I I was never I was never not hungry enough not to eat something else. Hmm. And then I started using this stuff. Um uh and and it's like magic. It's like someone switched, flipped a switch in my head. And for the first time I eat until I'm full. And then I'm like, oh, I don't need to eat anymore. Like I don't have any craving to eat anymore. And it's, it's, I think it's just something about my, my biochemistry. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Super interesting. Okay. Say what it was again. Cause everybody's good. Oh, now, oh, now, now I, now I forgot the name of it. It's, um, it was like Vitrizza or something or wait. Yes. <laughs> why can't, why can't, um, I wait, let me never, wait. never heard of that. It's, it's, a uh, it's, um, Victoza. Victoza is the name of it. It's, it's one of the less used of those. I think they're called like, um, GLP three inhibitors. Um, it's in the same category as those other drugs. The difference is that you, you administer every day as yeah. opposed to once a week. And, and I haven't tried the other ones. So maybe the other ones would be even more magical for me, but this one, like, honestly, I'll use it for the rest of my life. Like, it is so nice not to crave food mm. if I'm not hungry. It's magical. Interesting. So what are the writer's vices? Uh, long day of writing, man. And you talked about rewards. That's my, that's one of the main reasons I exercise, man, is rewards. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, honestly, I don't have that many vices. Like no? I watch too much TV. I should read more and watch TV less. Although there's so much good TV out right now. Um, I don't even really, I like, I have a drink once or twice a week. I used to like, really like cocktails. And and now a days, like I, I find they're just less, I mean, I actually think that like my vice is working Mm -hmm. that I really, really enjoy working. There have definitely been times that I get into the zone. I get into that flow state and my wife is trying to talk to me or my kids are trying to talk to me and I'm like, okay, okay, okay. And like, I'm just, I just want to work on the manuscript. Right. And, and so I would say that's my vice is yeah. that, I mean, so I, I decided to become a journalist when I was at Harvard business school. I, I, I had started a company right after college and I realized I didn't know what I was doing. So I went to business school at HBS and, and in business school between your first and second year, you go and you get an internship with the company that you're hoping will hire you after you graduate. And so I went back to New Mexico where I'd grown up. And I was working for a real estate private equity guy, or a group. He's this fantastic person named Jim Long. And, and the, the work was really interesting, but I realized that like I was at this inflection point. I could either go back to New Mexico and go into business, and, and my hope was to go into politics at that point, or I could become a journalist. And I had worked on my college newspaper. And I decided to become a journalist because the truth of the matter is like when I was doing real est- looking at real estate deals, the way you get good at real estate deals is you do the same deal over and over and over. And the, and the, the more practiced you become, mm-hmm. the better you are. And I got more and more bored. Hmm. Whereas when you're a journalist, you're learning something new every day, right? Like, as you know, like it's a podcast, doing podcasts, like the whole goal is to do something different each day. And I was just fascinated by stories. Hmm. And I thought to myself, like, if I run for office and I lose, I'm going to be bored out of my mind. Or if I do business, even if I'm successful, I, I'm probably going to get bored but I don't think I'm ever going to get bored trying to figure out how to tell great stories. Mm. And so as a result, like I have felt so lucky to be able to be a writer. And, and so I guess that's my vice is that like, I just love doing this job. And and you may have just stole the thunder from next category, which is (laughs) literally work career business. You know, what drives you, there. So, well, but I'll, I'll pick into that. Th- so you're saying, okay, you love to do a good story. Now you could tell stories about anything. You've obviously chosen it in a personal development context. So yeah. what drove, what drove you, you know, that direction and is driving you continually in, cause I'm going to put you in the personal development, business development, you know, maybe some people do, but personal development category. Tell me what's driving your work today. 
Well, I think so. It, it and I'll say that there's actually kind of like two two types of writing I do, right? So okay. I, I was a reporter at the New York Times for a long time, and I was an investigative reporter. So I investigated, I wrote a series about um, working conditions and Chinese factories where they make iPhones and iPads. Um, now I write for the New Yorker. I'm just finishing a piece about AI. And those really aren't personal development. The, those are stories okay. about the world, trying to explain, understand and explain the world to people and whether we should be happy about that or sad about that and what we should do differently. But when it comes to books, the thing I, I just I felt really strongly was there is so much important knowledge out there that if you get exposed to it can change your life for the better. And the problem is not actually finding the knowledge, right? With the internet, anyone can go on, go on Google search. They can look up any paper on earth. If you want to figure out how to stop procrastinating, you can just type, type how do I stop procrastinating right. into Google. The problem is not finding the information. It's making the information easy to absorb and understandable. And that's where the stories come in. And there is so much valuable information. We are living through understanding the brain and our bodies and our psychology in a way where this is the golden age of understanding ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so much of it is not changing people's lives, not because, not because it's bad science, but because scientists sometimes don't understand how to explain it to people. And so that's how I see my job is to find the stories that explain to people what this insight really means and how to use it in your own life. Hmm. And those stories are mysterious. Like most people think that the, the point of the story is the beginning and the end, but oftentimes it's the middle that helps you understand the idea. It's seeing someone fail three times and then finally succeed that helps you understand what that success means. It's interesting. I'm thinking about your story that we talked about it in the first show, uh, first story yeah. of, uh, Lawler, the right. Jim CIA Lawler, dude. the CIA agent. Yeah. First story in super communicators. And yeah, it is. It's the middle of the story of what he's going through that stands out more than, cause you kind of know you wouldn't have the story in there if it didn't have some kind of a decent ending. Totally. Totally. Like he's not going to fail in the end. Right. right. You, you don't watch Star Wars and imagine like, actually the dark side's going to win. <laughs> you, you, you know what's going to happen. <laughs> but that's, that's important for the writers that, you know, even myself as I'm writing more and to think about that, that I'm wanting, cause I'm a, uh, back to your, you, you know, the structure of super communicators. I'm kind of, let's get to the point. There's a you know decision here. There's a something there. And I don't naturally gravitate towards stories. I love them. I'm a product of them. I'm reading yours, but I don't tend to think that way and to put them in there and to realize that it's the, I've never heard that before. It's so interesting. So here's the way, here, here's another way of thinking yeah. about it. So like, um, so take Cinderella, right? Mm -hmm. We all know the beginning of Cinderella, like her parents die. She has an evil stepmother. We all know the end. She meets the prince, puts on the glass slipper. They live happily ever after. If you watch the movie of Cinderella, that constitutes about two and a half minutes of a two hour film. I never refer to that. I mean, so I got kids. Right. We talk about that movie. And what is it? Cinderella. It's what I kid one of the kids about when they're washing the dishes. dishes. Hey, get them done, Cinderella. You know, it's yeah. the middle. Yeah, you're totally it's, right. the, it's the middle. It's the mice. It's the, right. the sisters, the stepsisters being mean to her. It's Cinderella. Yeah. Like, and the thing is that when we think about how our brain learns, so if I expose our brains to an idea, the idea is too slippery for us to really grab onto it. The way that we have to take an idea and make it sticky is we embed it in a story. And it's the middle of the story that tells us how the idea works. So the idea of Cinderella is if you are virtuous and you try hard, Good things will happen in the end. But the only reason we believe and listen to that story is because of the middle, because we see her fail again and again. Mm -hmm. We see her try and do things and those things not work. We see Jim Lawler, the CIA agent. We see him try and recruit agents or uh, spies and fail at recruiting spies. Yeah. That helps us understand when the solution finally comes. It helps us understand what the solution means. It helps us absorb the solution. Because without seeing those failures, the solution the solution doesn't have any specificity. It doesn't have any borders. It's so hard to stay on track with my show format with you. 
<laughs> that's a sign of a good conversation. I know it's, it's the, I mean, that's a whole series story. I, you've got me thinking on that because again, it's not my, it's not my skill set. I adore a good story. I mean, I'm, I'm got to be at the top 1% of readers. I constantly fiction and nonfiction. I mean, I, I read it all and I love a good story. My mind doesn't think that way, but, uh, the but it middle. is just practice. It's okay. just a skill like storytelling yeah. and thinking about stories is entirely a learned skill. Hmm. Just like there are no super communicators that are born that way. They just, they know skills. There are no natural born storytellers. There's just people who have practiced it more. Well, you just gave me value there because I know that I tend to intellectually think about the beginning of the story and the end of the story. I'm just trying to get there. I'm trying to, okay, here's what happened. And I'm trying to make the point and I'm not given as much gravity, which I've had. I mean, my, my uh, editors had to push me to, to more story. Okay. Tell me more. And yeah. I struggled with that and I probably didn't do it justice because I didn't see the value and you just yeah. gave it to me. So my publishers, I'll give them their money back. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great book. You don't have to give them money back. The you did a good job. Okay, thanks. <laughs> thanks. Uh, that's so, that's, that's, uh, that's strong. So I, I hear you. I mean, but again, I, I I'm going to ask though, what did drive you? towards saying, I want, so you're, you're writing about in the New Yorker stuff, you say you're writing about life, but I mean, your books, I mean, the power of habit, I mean, I know a lot of people use it for a business context. I, I did, but I mean, I took it personally. I mean, yeah. so communicators, I'm taking it um, personally. I mean, these are things, your books to help us with our lives. Something drove you there. You could have written, you could have done a book on a uh, hundred other topics of interest, but yeah, you could gravitate here. Honestly, it's usually starts with a problem that I have in my own life. Okay. So like when it came to habits, like I'll tell you what, like how power yeah. to habit started. Like I, I was like, if I'm so, so smart and so successful, why can't I lose weight? Like, why can't I make myself go exercise in the morning? Why is it so hard for me to eat less and to exercise more? Like that doesn't make any sense to me. Everyone keeps telling me how smart and talented I am. And yet I can't do this thing that I see lots of other people do. And so I just wanted to find an answer. Like, like, what was the answer? What do I need to know about habits to improve my own habits? Mm. Same thing with super, communi super communicators. I was th this when I was at the New York Times. They made me into a manager, and I was like, "Oh man, I'm gonna be a I'm gonna be a fantastic manager, right?" Like, I have an MBA. I've had lots of bosses. Like, I know how to do this, and I was terrible at it. I was terrible. Well, you and went was, to Harvard and Yale. You're supposed to pull that card. Hey, you know what? I went right. to Harvard. Just, just do what yeah. I said. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. I And like, I was just ter. And the part that I was terrible at was the communication part. Mm -hmm. People would come to me with problems and they were clearly, uh, they clearly wanted to have an emotional conversation. Mm -hmm. And I would just bulldoze them and talk about practicalities, talk about solutions. And they would get pissed off and I didn't understand why they were pissed off. And this happened again and again and again. I was really bad. I was bad at listening to people. And so, and so, I, you know, like I actually had this moment where like, I sat down one night and I was like, okay, I'm going to write down all the times in the past year that I feel like I have done a bad job communicating. Hmm. And I started writing like the times that my kids came to me and they asked something and I kind of ignored them. The time that my wife, we were on a trip together and I like got all bent out of shape about the hotel room we were in. And she was like, why don't you just enjoy the vacation? And like, then we got into a fight because it was my, like I was being a jerk. Like I wrote all of those down and I was like, you know, I am a professional communicator. And it turns out I am terrible at this. Mm. And so I just wanted to learn how to do it better, like how to be a better listener and how to sure. be a better. And so I just started calling experts and telling them I was writing a book. So they had to talk to me and they did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I do with this show. It's, it's how I get free therapy. It's totally, it's totally yeah. yeah I, just the side tangent. I'm, I'm curious that back then when you are talking about losing weight, did you, um, well, I'm going to assume that you probably thought of yourself to some degree as undisciplined because especially in that area, um, I get kudos all the time for being so disciplined with athletics and food and whatever. And yet I look over and like finances, I got no discipline happening, you know, right. in finances and, and, you know, in, uh, sometimes in work, I'm not super disciplined and whatever, but you know, whatever, but you can get it over here. Did you feel that way? Even though obviously you were disciplined enough to become, to go to, you know, Ivy league school and oh, yeah. graduate. No, and I was, 
Like that's a, that's the thing that bugged me about it is that I was like, I could literally make myself sit down and work for 18 hours straight. Right. Like, like I had no problem with certain kinds of discipline. It was, but then other kinds of activities, I felt like I couldn't, I couldn't discipline myself at all. Right. And, and, and that's when I learned why habits are so important. It, like the answer is like, once you make that discipline into a habit, you reach flow state. Like you, it feels very, you're not actually exerting discipline. You're doing what comes naturally, which yeah. is you're acting out the habit. And if you don't have a habit around that behavior, it feels miserably hard because you do have to use all that willpower and that discipline. But yeah, I beat up on myself about this all the time. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to write Power of Habit was because I wanted to explain to people, like, you shouldn't be beating up on yourself. This is not your fault. Like, literally, it's just that you need to be taught how to build these behaviors into a habit. And then once you do, it's going to feel automatic. Yeah. It's not that you're weak. It's just that you don't know this crucial insight. Oh, I do want to make a call out again. I've been bragging about the book, but, you know, the the Power of Habit sold, I don't know, a few zillion copies and why we do what we do in life and business. I think that's why I so appreciated myself. It wasn't just how to do habits. It was why it helped me understand, yeah. which for me, that's, that's the story. That's the story yeah. that makes it sticky. Not just the how to, but totally. Uh, yeah, totally. Well, so thank you again uh, for <laughs> that book. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> Mental, as so we talked about a little bit about health and wellness and physical health, but on the mental side, yeah. your mind, uh, even mental state, what's, you know, what, what is your, going back to kind of your conversation focus, what's your goal? You know, when you look at that, my, your mind, your mental state, what's your goal and what's driving you there and what are you doing? Uh, so, so I, I try and, and meditate a couple times a week. And then I've actually had this thing that's happened recently that's been somewhat transformative for me. I started working with this breath coach, mm-hmm. and this is like a very like woo woo Santa Cruz Northern California thing, right? I'm, I'm in I'm in the oh, I was say I'm in the know. That sounds so egotistical. I mean, I'm aware. I'm I'm enamored. I'm interested. So go. Oh man, it's and I will say it's been magical. Like I was sort of skeptical, and like someone said you should try this, and I was like, okay, I'll try it. So I go in, and it's not even like he teaches me pattern breathing. Rather, what happens is he just, I just start breathe. I close my eyes, lie down. I'll start breathing and he'll give me little nudges, like breathe a little bit deeper, hold, like make that breath a little bit longer. And as you over oxygenate your blood, something really interesting happens, which is the central nervous system starts to just calm down. Mm-hmm. And the thing I've learned is my central nervous system is jacked almost all the time, mm-hmm. right? Because like, <clears throat> I'm someone who like likes to think and likes to be active and likes to get things done. And as a result, my central nervous system, it like helps me do that. I I'm go, go, go. And that's awesome. I'm, or I'm thinking about ideas all the time, but the cost of that is that when I do need to calm down, I can feel calm, but it's hard for my body to yes. actually fully calm. And the breath work helps I'm, me tap I'm in into your club. That. I'm raising my hand. Right. Yeah. Right. No. I will say like, it's well worth, there's a, there's a number like, um, you know, Andrew Huberman has this thing where it's a, uh, what does he call it? Non-sleep slow breath or something like that. There's, there's a, there's a couple of different ways of doing this. A lot of it is simply about taking deep breaths and exhaling them without pausing at the top or the bottom. Um, not so deep that it's painful, but deep enough that you're over oxygenated your blood. What'll happen sometimes is that you just stop breathing for literally like two minutes at a time without realizing it because you're so over oxygenated. Your body does not actually need to take in more oxygen. And, and what happens is that there is this relaxation and this kind of Call it Zen. Come on. Let's yeah, it's there. Zen. It's but it's also a little bit like it's like wakeful dreaming. Like I think some yeah. people describe it as like psychedelic or hallucinogenic. Like you you are able to relax and start thinking non-linearly. Yeah. And that's become really powerful and important for me wow. because it's helped me relax that central nervous system that otherwise I have a real trouble achieving. And that's a big part of my mental health. That's awesome. We need, I, I want to do a series on that. I experienced it honestly, for the first time I mentioned my surf story down in, Saint yeah. Luta, uh, in the spring of this year. And that was the first time I did it. So I had a buddy lead all of us guys, uh, in doing it. it was the first time I had. And now since then learning more about it, I have not dug into it a whole lot, but we had somebody, actually, I don't remember if it's somebody on the show or just somebody in my personal life, but she was talking about it 
uh, almost as a alternative to psychedelics. Oh, absolutely. It, it, yeah. Wim Hof is another person yeah. that, that, that you can yeah. look up that has a lot of like online tutorials and they'll take yeah. you through breathing. And, and honest, like I will say it is hallucinatory. Hmm. Like you're so relaxed and you're so in a different zone that you, you know, I, I mean, I, <laughs> describing this is like, it sounds like crazy, but like, you know, I sort of like have these stories playing out and behind my eye, my eyelids and it feels really rejuvenating. Hmm. Well, it's it's one that we'll serve for everybody to hear. We'll hit on because I want to dig into it more myself. I I read uh, James Nestor in that the yeah. breath book. Yes, and it just helped me be more aware of it. And kind of like you talking about, you didn't use the word anxiety. What did you use? Just uh, you know, kind of high energy. But you used, yeah, you used the just, word. But. Um, <sighs> I realized that my shoulders are usually up and I, I just, yeah, I remember to put them down and I realize, you know, even here I'm, I'm excited and I'm just little shallow breaths. Yeah. And, oh my gosh. If I will just the box breathing, just basic, anybody can look up box breathing, you know, breathe in for four, hold it for four out for four, keep it out for four. And, and even that will, so I can, I can sit here and watch my heart rate. Change. Totally. It'll bring you down. One of the things that someone told me is if you're, if you're ever going to go into a meeting where you're kind of nervous put both of your heels against the wall, breathe for just 10 seconds as deep as you can. And like, you will automatically feel calmer walking in. And, and again, like there's a lot of good physical reason. You, you mentioned Nestor's book, which is a wonderful book. And basically is this argument for breathing through our nose and yeah. breathing, yeah, yeah, breathing yeah. more deliberately. It's like our, our bodies have evolved to deal with a lot of stress and a lot of challenges, we have capacities within ourselves to react and to react really well to things that are hard. We have that. We have our bodies have evolved. Our minds have evolved to communicate really well. Yeah. And sometimes it's just a matter of reminding ourselves that we know how to do this and giving in to what feels natural. Yeah, I have to. Yeah, I, it's we we are so great at survival, but maybe yes. not at. I was going to thriving survival. We need to. That's the opposite yeah. of uh, survival. <laughs> uh, survival. All right. Um, tell me about money, money, finances, wealth. What's what what's driven you? What drives you there? So I love talking about money, and I, and I want to ask you the same question. So I I have this belief. I believe that. Money is a language just like Spanish or English or French. And that when you get fluent in it and you start thinking in it, it just makes it, it sort of opens up the the world of that language. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and I don't, I don't particularly, I'm not particularly greedy. I don't particularly like having material things, but I like thinking about money and I like talking about money because, because money is a way for us to talk about what's valuable. Mm -hmm. And and when we talk about money, if if it's a healthy conversation and a conversation that we welcome, then what we're really talking about is what matters to us most and how to prioritize things. So if I spend money on experiences rather than objects, what I'm saying is experiences are more meaningful to me. And it's hard, it's hard to figure out how to how to prioritize different things, right? Like how do I think about education versus spending time with my family versus being productive versus being successful? If we think about it in terms of money, and a lot of people shy away from this, what we're doing is we're, again, giving ourselves permission to take different things that are hard to compare and to compare them. Hmm. Because if I spend an, an hour working on something and I earn $200, then I can say, like, actually, spending time with my kids is worth more than $200. Like, I like, it doesn't make sense. I'd rather be home with my kids. Mm -hmm. If I could work on something and I earn 2000 or $20,000, then I can say like, actually, I don't mind spending that hour away from my kids because with $20,000, we can all go on a vacation together. Yeah. $2,000. We can all go on a vacation together. And this is, I think something that I, 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 I've been thinking about like someday I should write a book about money because so many people shy away from conversations about money. And it, and I think it's to the detriment of us and society, because if I'm talking to people that I work with about my salary and their salaries, then we know 
everyone has more information to get the right salary for themselves. If I'm talking to other families about like how much money they're saving for retirement, we know that it means we're going to all make better choices together. But many people get freaked out about money. They don't like to talk about money. It brings up a lot of emotions for them. My wife, um, oftentimes, like money is a very emotional topic. And in many ways, like my goal is to take the emotions out of talking about money and talk of it, talk about it as a way of just talking about what do we care about? Yeah. And I love it. Thank you uh, for that. That's I've grown in that. Money has not been a good language for me and yeah. one with baggage on it. And, and tell, tell me about that baggage. Like, where do you think that came from? It came from, I'm always hesitant or I, I want to preface it because this is not my dad. When I talk about businessmen, right. which my dad was, he's a well-known uh, businessman and, and coach and author. It was some after, after that. Um, I think, well, no, I, you know, I think he had, I'm going to, I haven't talked specifically, but I think he had some shame around money that came from mm-hmm. his dad. There, there was some shame. Shame around that. often accompanies money. Yeah. And they, they came from, oh, my, my grandfather was Amish. Um, oh, wow. Born Amish. And so I think there was some of that. And then got I got involved uh, as a young guy with some high powered businessmen that uh, had very questionable things happening behind the scenes. Right. Literally, the thought came into my mind, can you be a successful businessman, uh, make money and actually have people's care at heart, you know? And, yeah. and, and I juggled that cause here I was and I didn't know anything but to be my own business and I'm not a good employee. And so I'm doing that. So I am a businessman and yet I don't want to be a businessman. And so I sabotaged money over and over to try to prove that I was all heart. Yeah. So that's the yeah. baggage there. And I've gotten better with that and looking at providing value. It's worth money. And my kids actually need to eat sometimes. And, uh, doing that, but it's still you talking about that, um, you know, the spirit behind it. You know, I really appreciated having Ken Honda on the show, mm-hmm. uh, author of a Japanese guy, author of happy money and how we yeah. do that. And it was helpful for me just to look at, again, some of my negative perspectives on money and maybe on how I made it. not, well, not how I made it, but you know, maybe, that was actually powerful to me to look at. Am I happy with how I make it? Am I at peace with how I make yeah. it? Yes. How about how I spend it? Well, sure, but not if it's on something that I wish I didn't have to spend it on. I'm not happy to give it the mechanic. I'm, I'm here. Right. And he said, well, you know, kind of changing that, playing with the paradigm there. So it's been a work in progress for me. And by the way, I think that everything you're describing and feeling is totally natural and is true for 99% of people. Mm. And And I think that, I think that the more, the more we normalize talking about money, the more we make it a happy topic, the more we take away that shame and we take away that self doubt. And we take away that thing about like, I have to prove to myself, even if I'm making money that like, I'm not going to spend it or I don't deserve it, or I'm not a business person. Like we, we never talk about that way about athletics, right? Like, like the fact that like um, the fact that you can run faster than I can, that doesn't make me feel bad. That's just like a difference between us. It's like a difference of priorities. But like, if I came up to someone and I was like, I make more money than you. Yeah. If we're comparing bank accounts, if we're comparing bank accounts rather than like, you know, like mile times, it's a, it's like going to set off all these alarm bells. It's going to make people feel terrible about themselves, but it shouldn't, Hmm. it shouldn't, it should be something that we can as, as community members and as communities and as partners talk about as easily as we talk about anything else, because when we do talk about it as easily as anything else, when we take the emotional shame away from it and the fear and the feelings of inadequacy, then it just becomes a choice that we're making, right? Do I want to earn more money? Then then if the answer is yes, then I I should probably work a little bit more, but it's also fine if I want to spend more time with my kids and earn a little bit less. As I, I only need so much money to pay for my like food and housing. And as long as I achieve that, then I can spend the rest of my time doing the things I care about. That's a much healthier attitude. Yeah. And yet for most people, if you say to them, it's okay to make a choice to make less money, they'll actually see that as a weakness or as a, as a giving up. Mm-hmm. There's so much that we read into money. And like, I think the more we, the more we normalize talking about it, 
the more we free ourselves to just see what money as what it is. Money is literally just a way for allocating scarce resources. If an hour is worth $200 or worth spending an hour with my kids, it allows me to compare what, how I should make, how I should allocate the scarce resource of my time. You got my vote for writing a book on money. Okay. <laughs> uh, Charles, ser- I mean, seriously, that's, uh, it, it would be significant. It's interesting. You got me thinking uh, a couple months ago, I was at a adventure with my bunch of my guys. It was 10, 15 of us. I don't know. Sat down and there's usually a few people there. I don't know. Uh, and I got one guy on one side of me who's, I don't know how many millions he's worth. Just, just far more than anyone needs, but you know, that's just what he did. It's what he chose to do over here. And the guy next to me who I didn't know is a, I can't remember the title, but it was like the chief, whatever the task force for, uh, fell, uh, not felons. What do they call it? I don't know. So whatever the, the thing catching bad guys. Okay. Well, he's not making much money. We know that, right? you know, so from a monetary standpoint, but that's what he loved to do. It's what he chose to do. Uh, at, and we are so much better for the fact that like someone who loves that and is good at it chooses to do it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> at a fraction of the investor guy over here, who's a beautiful guy as well, but what he does, the, the world for whatever reason, well, and then we can get into muddy stuff because the, the value the world gives to, you know, different things like teachers and cops yeah. and whatever. But, um, yeah, thank you for the, the choice aspect. Yeah. There's so much. Yes. You, you mentioned shame. I think just bitterness. Yes. Uh, around money and insecurity. Gosh, insecurity. Insecurity is a huge yeah. part of it. Yeah. And, and I'll mention one other thing Please. that like in my advocacy for talking more about money is that the thing I have found and the studies bear this out is that the more you talk about money, yeah. the more financially secure you tend to be. So like I mentioned that I went to business school yeah. among my business school friends, talking about money is not something that like is looked down upon at all. Like they love talking about money. And in fact, I know what most of my business school friends earn because it's not a weird thing to say. It's not a weird thing to be like, yeah, I got my bonus. It was 200 K like, like it's it's saying that is as natural among that crowd as saying like, you know, I own a Porsche or I weigh 180 pounds. Like, like it's, there's no, there's no layers of like issues on top of it. So people who talk about money a lot, who it's very normalized and it's very easy and it's not laden with a lot of negativity. They are also people who tend to think more about money. Hmm. And when you're thinking just a little bit more about money, you see ways to save your money and to make money that might not be apparent, right? Like if you don't like talking about finances and you shy away from it, then you're probably not going to get that phone call from your banker who says like, by the way, you're in this you're in a, in a savings account. It's only paying 1%. But if we put you in some treasuries for six months, they pay 5%, hmm. right? Like you're not going to invite that phone call. Yeah. You're not going to, so you're not going to have it and you're just going to miss out on earning some interest. So it's well worth talking about money because it just makes you better at managing money. It's interesting you saying that, Charles. It makes me think that you know it would be a great exercise for people to find somebody, even if you have to pay a therapist, you know, just to say, "Look, this is what I make. This is how I feel about it. This is how we were the struggle." Totally. And I have friends like we very explicitly call each other to be like, "Hey, let's talk about like let's talk about money for the next hour." Huh. Like I'm I'm thinking of like moving my investment here, or like I'm thinking about refinancing my house, and just you just talk it out. Hmm. I essentially, I probably talked about it more in the past year because one of the guys who's grown to be uh, one of my closest friend now is a wealth manager. Uh, and otherwise, I just, I never talked about money and that's kind of his yeah. world. So yeah, it's kind of like we talked about in the first show, talking about real estate, again, talking about money. I, I do, guys, I'm out. You want to talk about <laughs> bikes or something or wine? Uh, I'm, I'm happy to talk. Uh, man, thank you for, thank you for sharing all that. Um, achievements is next. You know, what drives your achievements? You're a guy who's, yeah, I was reading the stats on, you know, how many copies this book sold. I would be happy to have the achievement of doing that. You've had some good ones, but you look now, you said you're almost 49. What's driving your achievements? So I, I, I've been very lucky. I will say if there was a period in my life when, um, 
like the, I, when I really wanted, I was doing work at the New York times and I wanted to do work that was worthy of a Pulitzer prize. And like the prize seemed like, seemed like an important thing to me, like a, a stamp of approval that like, I'm a good journalist. And then that happened. And basically my life did not change at all. <laughs> and it actually happened the same year that the power of habit came out. And writing The Power of Habit has been totally life-changing, not because it sold so many copies, although that's a really nice thing and I feel very lucky, but because I get these amazing emails from people who say, I read your book and it helped me quit drinking, or I read your book and it helped me stop procrastinating, or I was able to build this habit, or I was able to talk to my kids. Like That's actually the achievement. He, my goal is that I want to write stuff that touches people's lives so profoundly that they feel like they have to send me an email mm. telling me what's happened. And I don't, I also, I don't want it to be small. Like when I write stuff, my goal, th I this does not mean that I hit this goal, but like when I write articles or I write books, I want at least a million people to read it. And that's kind of just an arbitrary number. But like the point is I want to do something. I want it to be important enough and well done enough that a lot of people get exposed to it because yeah. it means that like when people are giving me their time, when they're doing interviews with me, researchers, I'm justifying their use of like their precious hours with me. And, and so what I find is most meaningful is, a, is like achievement is I want to write things that I'm proud of um, where I read them and I'm like, you know what, if I was a reader, I would read this and love this. Mm -hmm. And then I want to write things where people read it and they are so moved that they feel like they have to reach out to me and have to, then that we ha we should have a relationship. Cause that's, that's like a big thing, right? I, I remember, I remember doing that when I was like, there are people who have been exposed to their art or their work. And I've been like, I just have to contact that person. Yeah. yeah. That's meaningful. Yeah. And, and if I'm, if I'm the vehicle that allows someone to have that experience, it feels really good. That's thank you. That's how about you? Like, what do you, what, like, what's the, what's the measuring stick that you use? Well, you said, I was going to share that you said something is kind of the, that effect. Um, I find myself wanting to start things or things to exist that I just want to be a customer of. Like, I just yeah. want that to exist because I want to benefit from it and to be, you know, so if I'm part of it and we make a billion dollars, that's great. Or if, you just somebody takes the idea. I just want it to exist. I just feel like it would help. It would help me. Um, totally. I probably that's the catalyst for stuff that I get involved in. But and the you know it's where to wear out the term drive. I, I realize I want. I've always been um, motivated to to get people inspired about what they're doing, just their daily yeah. life, and even that. That's a big bigger part of what we're doing as a personal development company is um, talking about achievements. But so, oh gosh, you, you mentioned him earlier. So I had Robert Waldinger on the show and asked him about this. He said, man, um, he said, I work a lot. He says, I probably work too much. Uh, he says, I love what I do. And he says, I have big achievement. I, you know, he's what he's probably, is he 60? Yeah. yeah. Something like that. Yeah. And he said, I still have big achievements that I want. But he says, I have gotten to where I'm now, I don't know if he said, I need to go back and listen to it. Cause I, I've said this so many times. I need to go back and listen to what he said, but I'm, I'm as, as much motivator or maybe even more to just enjoy the path that I'm on. Yeah. That is, so we're, we're, we're changing even some of the vernacular around this business of, you know, how we want to help you be driven and drive towards whatever that goal is, but even more so. I just want you to enjoy the drive today. I want to enjoy the drive today. Cause I spent so much time, going after that achievement and not paying attention to the day and totally, totally. And like, and, and at some point your brain will realize like, what's the point of doing all this work if I don't get a chance to enjoy the fruit of this labor. Right. Yeah. And like, sometimes the fruit of the labor is like the labor. Like sometimes it's just like you get to do a job that you enjoy doing. And I will say, sometimes I write stories to, to the point you just made about being a being a, a consumer or being a, a buyer of the thing we make. Sometimes I write stories for the New Yorker that like our audience only kind of likes, but like I love that story. Like if I was one of our readers, I would read that story and like read it all day long. Yeah. 
And that's okay. Like, I'm not going to, a million people aren't going to read that. It's going to be this small little group, the, but I just love making it so much. Like I mo- love putting it in the world. It feels so good to me. Okay. All right. This, I mean, here we are, we're, yeah. we're, we're about to hit three hours and I just, I, I, I wish I was there. We go get a glass of wine and just keep talking. It's um, fun. It's really like having, having a life where you actually get to have fun mm-hmm. and having that mastery and that flow. I cannot think of like, I, I, that is success. It's, I don't, yeah. that's it. There's the achievement. I don't, that's yeah. actually, I'll use that, 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 you know, we'll help you. Everybody has achievements and I have them too, that I want to get to out there. But the best achievement is if you just enjoyed today, I just can't. Yeah. I, it's a big deal. I regret the days that I didn't do that. I wasn't aware. Yeah. Uh, Me too. Here we are. Um, Last one is interest, just personal interest. The things that you do just for you might be non-productive, might be hobbies, might be, uh, you talked about surfing as a, you know, just a fun yeah. thing that you do. It just inspires you, gives you joy. Anything else fall in that category? You know what I actually, what I love, I love modern art. Like I really like, I just, when I was, when I was in college, I, um, I studied intellectual history, which is like the, the history of ideas and how one idea like bleeds into the next idea. And art turns out to be like a big place where ideas, ideas kind of pass and change. Mm. And so one of the things I love to do is if I'm in a new city, I'll go to like whatever their contemporary art museum is. And like the thing about contemporary art is you look at it and usually at first you're like, I don't understand why this is in a museum, right? Mm. Like it looks like someone threw paint against a wall. It's like a, like a boring sculpture. And then, and then the game is to like, either through like Googling or reading what's on the wall or just thinking deeply about it, figure out like somebody thought this was really, really special. Mm. Like what did they see in it? Mm. And there's usually some idea that hasn't occurred to me that as soon as somebody points it out to me, I'm like, Oh my gosh. Yeah. This is actually like a perfect example. There was this painting or a picture I once saw of a group of Israeli soldiers clapping and one of the soldiers is missing a hand and he's clapping. And from one perspective, you're like, that just seems like a photo, right? Like it just seems like somebody shot a photo, but this idea, if you, if you think about like what the military means and what membership in the military means, and for Israel, this country that like everyone has to be in the military and that, that, you know, that, it's all about kibbutzes and community. And, and at the same time, there's this guy who can't clap because he gave up his hand, assumably in battle. Like there's so many layers that if you sit and think about it, like all of a sudden you're like, wow, that's actually like a profound piece of art. That's what I love. That's my interest is going and finding things that like don't look profound at first and then understanding why someone else fell in love with it and what I can learn from that. That is really interesting because it opens up (laughs) something similar that I have. And it's, it's music is more the muse, but I've been, I used to live in Nashville and fortunate enough to know a lot of people, uh, professional people in that space. And I love to hear, you know, they always want to show you, here's a new song, you know, sit down. Yeah. And, follow, here's a, and it's awesome. And I want to know, okay, where did that come from? I love yeah. the stories, but that's why I hear you taking the art and back to your focus on story. You want to hear where did that come from? What's the story behind it? I love that with right. music. Interesting. I haven't, yeah. done, I haven't done it with art like that. And I, I haven't, I don't really do it with music now that you've inspired me to go like, think about, think about songs that way. Like, where does that come from? Huh? M- music is a huge love of mine. And I've given that to my family, I guess. So one of the main things with my kids is sharing music. We have Spotify playlists that we do and we find that we're most in, we just organically interested in people who are relatively unknown and you go, oh, interesting. Where did this girl come from or this guy and you find their story and and we love doing that and find them on YouTube doing um live, you know, version yeah. stuff. Yeah. It's kind of but it's along there. I've never thought about it with art like that. Okay? I can try that. I remember the last art museum I was in. Um it was an ask. Cool. It was I'll start I'll start sending you some uh, some songs. Okay. And, and uh or you send me songs and I'll send you some some Fair. art pieces. Fair. <laughs> Man, it just again, such a gift. This is uh thanks for super communicating with me. Thank you uh, for having me on. This has been such fun. It's great. Oh, back to your again. I, I hope I think we did a good job of 
of uh, depicting what your point is to have the matching, to have the the resonance uh, yeah. with each other, the frequencies and the, you know, and, and all that is such a joy when you do that. And it's, it's interesting. Yeah. It's funny as I were talking here and I'm going, Oh, this is, I'm doing that thing that you talk about. That's totally. And the time just flies by, right? It's been three hours and it just felt like three yeah. hours. And to be, again, I love the concept, Charles, of just, we all look at it kind of happenstance. Oh, they've got that gift or that happened with me with this person, but not here. And I've done that somewhat of just going, you know, kind of happenstance of going, no, you can help this occur, connect with people more uh, naturally, uh, more consistently, more authentically. Uh, yeah. I appreciate you putting that in there. So I'm going to share this first. Well, I was going to say share it with my kids. We're going to share it with you know tens of thousands of people. On the <laughs> proud about that part, but uh, with my kids. Um, yeah. Well, let me know how it goes. I, 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 I want. I want to hear. I will. I will. Hey, thank you. Thanks for the time. Thanks, and, man. And folks, I want to drive you guys again. The book is uh, Super Communicators: How to Unlock the Secret Language of Connection. And I think that we'll publish this, Charles, right around when it comes out in February 2024. Um, and go and connect with Charles and everything he's doing. It's Charles Duhigg, D U H I G G. And I didn't write it down again. Please give me that. I'm going to write it down this time. Oh, sure. Give it's, me the uh, email address. Charles, Charles at doohig.com. Okay. So it's just my name.com, Charles at doohig.com. Right, and he actually responds to him. He says, like, I, I do. It's kind of convicting to me as well. I, I just put <laughs> an email address. And let us know, just like he said, we talked about in the first episode, let us know what you got out of this. Leave us a review, yeah. uh, rating on Spotify, a review on Amazon and, and say, uh, give us some feedback, but you can give it again, give it email Charles as well. You can see us, you can see the whole episode on YouTube and we'll have a bunch of clips on social media that you can always find, as you know, at Kevin Miller CEO. And if you want to yeah. learn how to master your own inner drive, check out my book, What Drives You on Amazon. And until next time, stay driven. Thanks so much for joining me on this journey. I look forward to meeting you in the Drive Tribe community for ongoing discussions about each episode. You can subscribe to the Drive Drop newsletter for weekly updates. Find it all at kevinmiller.co along with all our social media and video clips. Until next time, I hope this episode helps you drive further and enjoy the ride. Yeah.